Lord, but most of all, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We ask that you will hide your word in our hearts, Lord, that we may not sin against you, Lord. Lord, we thank you again, and we praise your name, and we bless your name today, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and we bless each and, every, bless each and every one until, Lord. And we just thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our reading in uh, Acts chapter 17. Let's take a listen. Chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. 
because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, albeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. All right, <clears throat> so there we go, chapter 17. Now, uh, in a nutshell, chapter 17 takes us to three cities. It takes us to Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. And in each of those cities, we see how um, there was a certain response to the preaching of Jesus. One thing that you can always count on is that you know, when you start talking about Jesus, you're going to get people to either come closer, and they're going to come closer to hear, or come closer to fight, or they're going to go away. They're going to go away because they don't want to hear it. They're going to go away because they, they kind of believe it but don't want to accept it. And some people just don't want to even acknowledge it as possibly being true. But the, the name of Jesus always produces strong reactions in the majority of people. It always has been, and it probably will always continue uh, until the Lord comes back. Uh, you're going to have people that are going to be extremely angry, and some people will be extremely um, happy to hear it, because uh, it is good news when you hear the name of Jesus and the, the preaching of the gospel. But it starts off and tells us, it says that now <clears throat> they had passed through uh, Ampham, uh, and Pen Pen yeah, that city, and uh, and they came to Thessalonica, and uh, they they were at the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as it says in, in verse uh, two, it says, as his manner was. So this is something that he com he um, commonly did when he would go to different cities. As his manner was, he went uh, unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So he began to speak to them about the things that pertain to Christ out of the scriptures. Now when it says out of the scriptures, what scriptures are we talking about here? What scriptures did Paul have? The Holy Scriptures. Did he have the book of Acts? Did he have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No. What did he have? The Holy Spirit. What scriptures? What books? What writings? Think about it. See, we often think, and that's one thing that we have to uh, make sure that we do. When we read this, we think that he had a leather-bound Bible like what we got. No. That's not what he had. He had uh, the writings of the prophets yeah. and the writings of the um, of Moses. So he had Moses' writings and he had the writings of the So basically, we would say he had an a Old Testament scripture. He had writings from the Old Testament. So he was preaching Christ from where? From the Old Testament. You see that? Mm -hmm. Which is why when we, when we do finish um, the, uh, the New Testament and we start the Old Testament, and it's going to be good that we, we, we have this familiarity with, the Lord, with, with, with our Lord and his teachings. And then when we go into the, the Old Testament, we're going to see him in so many different ways. There are what we call types, allegories, shadows, similitudes, a lot of things that refer to Jesus in so many ways and the whole relationship between the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit and us, the, the, the church, the Bride of Christ. And it's amazing to me how that people that understand the Old Testament, mainly speaking about the Jewish people, can read that and not see it. But we understand that what, the, what the Jesus said, they are what? Blind. Blind. So they can't see it. They'll read the scripture day after day after day, and they cannot see it. And they are blind. The Bible said they're blind in part. Number one, mm -hmm. not all of them are. There are some, some Jewish, Jewish Christians. Jesus. Exactly. And uh, the Lord said that it's going to be, their blindness is going to be what? Lifted. Lifted. It's going to be taken away. So they would be able to see. All right? But it's amazing to me, uh, a lot of times when you read this, and they just will not see. But yet Paul preached to them Christ from the scriptures, from the writings of Moses and all the, the, the prophets. All right? 
And um, in verse 3 it says, And open and uh, alleged that Christ must need had suffered. He proved to them through the scriptures that Christ had to suffer. And be risen from the dead. And this is Jesus, whom I preach unto you. He is Christ. All right? So he's using that to show that he had to suffer because the Jewish people are looking for a Messiah that's going to come and bring peace and bring them um, uh, 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 unity and bring them uh, security. And it's interesting because when the Antichrist comes, the Bible says that he is going to deceive many by the way of peace. So he's going to use peace. And everybody, who doesn't want peace? Nobody wants war. But the Lord says that the Antichrist is going to, going to deceive them. But see, remember what we said before. That the devil is a liar. He, the Bible says he is the father, father of lies. And the Antichrist is coming in the, in the vein and in the spirit of the devil. So no matter what he does or what he says, and no matter how good it seems to seem to be, it's going to be a what? A lie. A lie. But you also can keep this in mind. God cannot lie. So no matter if you are a child of God, no matter how bad your circumstances seem to be, no matter how rough they seem to be going, God says that he has blessed you. And you say, oh, my goodness, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, seem, don't seem like it's blessed. But you got to keep in mind, who told you you were blessed? God said it. God said if you give your heart to the Lord, if you follow Jesus, you are blessed. And he cannot lie. No matter how the circumstances seem to be. Now, if you're like me, that's kind of hard to deal with sometimes. When you go through the tough times, you have to remind yourself, don't you? Wait a minute. You know, God is, God is good. He's not. You know. I often think about, remember, and we, we talked, we, we saw when a couple of chapters previous where Peter was in jail. And remember uh, when the angel came and, and had to do what? Wake Peter up. What was Peter doing if he had to be woken up? Sleeping. He was sleeping. Wait a minute, man. They, they're talking about how they're going, you know, they, they might uh, whip him or may put him on trial or he might be executed. Peter in the jail doing what? Sleeping. Just, just taking a nap. He learned the lesson. Because remember when Peter was in that boat? And that, when the waves were going, Peter was a professional fisherman. A boat is not a strange thing to him, nor working on the seas. He knows how to handle a boat. But when that wave came, which was an unusual wave, and the storm hit, Jesus was in the boat too. What was Jesus doing? Sleeping. He was sleeping. You know why Jesus was sleeping? Because he knew... I'm not gonna, he, he didn't let anything that the devil brings upset him. He took a nap. But the, what did the disciples do? They were all anxious. And they were like, Lord, Lord, do you not care that we're going to perish? And he said, oh, ye of what? Little faith. Little faith. All right, and then, but then he said, peace be still. And the, and the waves calmed down. But the point is that you, Jesus was the example. In the midst of all your storms, God says, you're going to be blessed. Don't worry about it. And Jesus didn't worry about it so much that he, he took a nap. Well, now here we go down in the book of Acts where Peter now has learned and he's got filled full of the Holy Ghost and he sees the scriptures and now he's in jail, bound up. Don't know what his future is going to be tomorrow based on the hands of these, these people. But he does know that God has made him a blessed individual. See, the problem that we have today is that the, 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 the modern church is telling you that, yes, you are a blessed individual, but your blessings are manifest by how big your bank account is. And that's the, that's the, the error that we have with a lot of the popular preaching today. It has nothing to do with your bank account. You are blessed because you know Lord, the Lord, and you have been transformed. The Bible says that we are to, not to be conformed to this world, but to be what? Transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be what? Born, Born again. again. So that makes you what? A new creature. creature. You see, um, we are all sons of Adam. We're descendants from, the, from, from, from Adam. Um, 
Adam was the son of who? Adam was the son of God. We are not we were we were not born sons of God. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be what? Born again. Because when you're born again, then you become born not of flesh, but of what? Of the spirit. That's what makes you a son of God. That's why you are blessed. Because once you become born again, you are no longer a son of Adam. You are a son of God. You are a child of the Lord. And that's why you're blessed. No matter what this world tries to tell you, everything this world tells you is a lie. You are blessed because you're born of God. And once you're born of God, you instantly are up. And, and, but keep in mind, don't let nobody try to confuse you by telling you, well, you know you're blessed because you got money. That has nothing to do with it. You're blessed because of your heritage. You now come directly from God. Your line from Adam has been erased or covered up, dismissed, and now you have a direct genealogy, if I use that word, or heritage from who? From God. God. That's why you're blessed. So you are blessed, period, because you know the Lord. And we always have to remember that. Because this world will continuously lie to you, to you and to me, and tell us that we're not blessed. Because maybe we got something's wrong with our body, or something's wrong with our with our uh, our bank account, or we got some some uh, family issues, or we got this. that's all a lie. This world will lie to you because this, who is the prince of power of this world? The devil, and he will lie continuously to us to tell us to try to convince us that we're not blessed. And then if he can't convince us that we're not blessed, he tries to distort what being blessed means. And then we get discouraged because we ain't got a million dollars in the bank. You are blessed because you know the Lord and you are a child of God. You have been born again. God cannot lie. Now if we can rest in that and just go on through, through what we got going on here, whatever it may be, trust the Lord. We'll find that the Lord will bring us through However, it is that he has designed to bring us through. And we can go through with many different people that have gone through. And some of them, well, from our perspective, looks like they didn't win. They looked like John the Baptist win from some people's perspective. But yet Jesus said John the Baptist was the what? Greatest man born of a woman. All right? So John the Baptist had his what? Head chopped off. We'll follow in Paul. Guess what's going to happen to Paul? Paul's going to be, he's going to have his head chopped off. Guess what's going to happen to Peter? He gets crucified. Right? Crucified upside down. upside down. Wait a minute, I thought you said they were blessed. They were. And they are. So it's hard sometimes because the world tries to get us so caught up in material things, how things are, uh, uh, how we look, how, we, how, we, how people perceive us, and all those things, and that can cause you to stay deceitful. Uh, um, deceived on what true blessings are. All right, so I went on that rant and rave because <laughs> I think it's important sometimes for us to understand that, and I think oftentimes we forget it. All right, now um, where was we at? All right, so if he 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 preached out of the scriptures that it it it, it must needs be that Christ would suffer. All right, and so Christ's suffering produced his his what his victory. All right, and that's why he was able to prove to them through Scripture that Christ was the Messiah, and through a, a lot of different things. All right, we won't, I'm not going to get on that that soapbox. Let's go on to verse four. And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and with and, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. So that means a lot of the the, the uh, devoted Greeks and some of the head women of that of, of uh, Thessalonica believed. Look at verse five. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with what? Envy. Envy. All right. Here we go. See, it has nothing to do with trying to find out the truth. 
It has nothing to do with trying to find out what's right. Nothing to do with finding out what's, what's, what's wrong. Everything is motivated by a base emotion of envy. These, he's getting more popular in his preaching about Jesus than what we already have. And people are following him. And so what we see there, their motivation is envy. They took certain lewd fellows of a baser sort. Basically, he went and found some thugs. Went and found some gangbangers. Get somebody that he knew can, can, can wield a pistol. Oh, wait a minute. They didn't have pistols back then. They wield a sword. Get a dagger. Get a spear. Get a club. All right? People that can cause issues and riots and stuff like that. Of a baser and lewd sort. And gathered a company. And set all the city in an uproar. Trying to create a riot. And assaulted the house of Jason. Now why did they come to the house of Jason? Because that's where they, they uh, knew that Paul and Silas were. And sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren to the rulers of the city, crying, These uh, are they that have turned the world upside down and are come hither also. So they, they acknowledge that wherever Paul goes, wherever Silas and wherever Paul and Silas go, this preaching of Jesus causes people to radically change the way they're thinking. It changes people profoundly. They are not the same. And therefore, the whole town, the whole community changes because the people change. This is something that our, 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 that we need to look at from a political standpoint. We are so focused on changing laws, and if you get a law to change, you get some legislation going that will make people do certain things. That, it, and sometimes you need to have that, but the true way to get people to do what is honorable is to change the what? The people. If you don't get to the hearts of the people, you know, there's a lot of people out there that say, look, I'd rob a bank if I thought I could get away with it. Mm -hmm. no, a lot of people would do that. Well, if, I, if, if, if I thought I could walk in there, get a million dollars out there that don't belong to me, steal that million dollars and walk out that bank and, and not get caught, I'd do it. So, yes, we need laws. We need you know, all, all the consequences to come around, around for what is wrong or right. But guess what? If you change the heart of people to say, you know what? Why should I go in there? And take all these people. She got her money in there. She got her money in there. He got her, his money in there. Why well, am I going to steal all their money just so I can have it? That's pretty selfish. I'm just going to go try to see if I can find me a good job. I'm going to work hard at something. I'm going to look to see what my talents, what my gifts, what I have can do. Then I'm gonna, once I find my talent and my gift, I'm going to perfect it. I'm going to get to be the best I can be at this gift or this talent so I can perfect it. And then go on out. See, what does that do? It produces in you motivation to better yourself, right? And the better you are, more chances are you going to have of making, you know, a decent salary. Right? So you keep on trying to do what you got to do. You know, I'm going to find this, I'm going to do that. And, 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 and while you're trying to perfect yourself, while you're going through that road of up and downs, because when it comes, especially nowadays, when it comes down to finding a job, <laughs> it's up, down, left, right. You know, sometimes, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You know, I remember. You need to start from the bottom to work yourself up in the company. That's what my um, passion told us. Yeah. If you want to go further in the company, you got to work yourself up. Yeah. But I had s some bosses would tell females, well, I'm not going to give you this position because you know why? Because in three more years and so you have a baby. So I got to get into a man. Mm. Yeah, well, so that still goes on. It's, yeah. But, but there's a lot of things that you have to, I mean, when I was, uh, there was some times when, and I had a, I had a, I had a family and uh, I was in between jobs, and I had to flip burgers. I did it for a bit, you know, then I worked the path mark, cleaning up the aisles. You know, I did it for a while. I, I mean, I had to do something. I did security work, you know, I had three jobs. Cause none of the, <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, you get one really nice job, then that's, that's good. But sometimes, I ain't got, I didn't, I didn't have one really nice job. So I had to get three jobs that they, they were just, it was just work. You know, I'm, I'm cleaning up, I'm cutting grass, cleaning up uh, 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 aisles and putting produce out, and I'm doing security work. And I'm going to tell you, I was the worst security guard you ever wanted to have. Because I wasn't securing nothing but the back of my eyelids. 
I was asleep. Yeah. I was asleep. I, that was, you know, some people are good. I am not a security guard. That's what they had to do. That's what they had to do. They would come in that con. con Look, I tell you what though, I didn't let nobody in there. Even the people that belong there, they had to toot the horn. Do do, cause I'm. I, I had to wake up. How you do that? You fine. Well, I, originally they they had to say, well, you know, we need we need you to. They ain't moving from place to place. And I kept falling asleep. That was not my job. That was not my talent. It was not my gift. I couldn't do it. I see guys that work there. And they done worked their way up, and you know they got the little badges and the stripes and all that, and they right. they, they, they go, no more. you know, <laughs> and they go in there and they know how to, you know, they they, they work all three three thirty in the morning. They bright, uh, perfect. Three second rule, you know. Three second rule. Three <laughs> three thirty in the morning. I am like, even if my eyes are open, I am still <laughs> sleeping. Me, me. I am like, huh? So, but you had to do what you had to do, yeah. you know. And so th that's okay. You know, it's, it's part of this world. And remember, keep this in mind. You are blessed. But this world is what? Cursed. Curse. And the one part of you that still has not been transformed is your what? Your body. See, the body, this body is going back to the what? Dust. To the dust. It's going back to the dirt. So your, 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 the Bible says we are to renew our minds. Our spirits have been born again. You know, and so now we just have to wait for the redemption of the body. But this body exists in this corrupt world. And so, and that's why when Paul and and and, um, and Peter and John the Baptist, when all they were put to death, the Lord didn't look at it like how oftentimes we look at it. We look at it. Oh, they must. They, that was a failure. There, they didn't. They didn't accomplish anything. They they just got put to death. That ain't how God see, sees it. And sometimes we look at ourselves. Well, you know. I was hoping to, you know, get me a job, you know, making X amount of money, and here I am making making this. And you think you're not doing what it is that you, you don't feel blessed, but yet you you forget the people that you work with, some people that you encourage, stands that you took, they cost you, right? And but people, they cost you, but people remember that. It sticks in people's minds. You never know what kind of seed you plant in people's mind because you took a stand. And you didn't get that promotion, or you didn't get that because you took a stand, you know, that was right, or, 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 or you voiced your opinion about something that you felt the company wasn't doing that was proper. All those things, you know, you don't think that it, well, look, you did that, look what it got you. Don't do that. Don't even worry about that. God has, uh, uh, he understands that he puts in you, in your heart and in your mind, rights and wrongs and do's and don'ts. And you'd be surprised how when God wants you to speak up. Now, Paul did the same thing. Paul spoke up, and he got in trouble. You think Paul, you think it cost Paul? But you think Paul thinking, I'm not doing the will of the Lord because I got in trouble. No. It didn't cost him. It cost him maybe being able to stay in that town. It cost him being able to, you know, walk around freely. But look what is written about him in scripture. Look at his eternal blessing. That's why I said Paul was blessed. And the reason why we know he's blessed because we, we're seeing it from what? From God's point of view. All right? But we need to look at our life from God's point of view. Sometimes all we're looking at it is from our own point of view. But God is looking at us saying, don't you worry about this person. They all right. They may not have all this. And they may not have all that. And, and this might not be what they were hoping it would be, but they are right smack in the middle of my will. That's exactly where I want them to be. And it's hard for us. I mean, look at the story of Job. Look at what happened to Job. You all right, sis? Yeah. Yeah, Elijah, get her nappy. Look what happened to Job. Um, you know, he got into that situation, and God said, have you considered my servant Job? God, God is the one that put Job out there. Because God knew, I can let Job go through all this craziness, and Job will never forget that he's a blessed person. And Job lost all his wealth. He lost everything, even lost his children. But Job never forgot. And God, God said that uh, he never lost his integrity. The devil said, I'm going to make Job curse you. I'm going to make Job 
quit serving you and curse you to your face. Because the devil thinks that if you don't have wealth in this world, you're going to hate the Lord. But now, if you think about it, this modern preaching is emphasizing that. Got to have the wealth of this world. Got to have all this stuff. That's not so much true. All right. Now, I, do we need a couple dollars in our pocket? Yeah. Yes, we do. That's why when I didn't have a job, I was flipping burgers. <laughs> I needed some dollars. Mm -hmm. I know I need some dollars. I, mean, I, got, I got to eat. I got to pay my bill. But you know what? I'm not going to go out there and rob no bank. I'm not going to go out there and mug somebody. I'm not going to go out there and sell drugs. That's right. You know, I'm not going to do that. Right. Even though I do need some money. And you sit there and you watch some drug dealers, they driving them Mercedes and got all that stuff. Yeah, but then they get caught later on. There you go. And, they, I, and, they, I, and they're all done. I know big time drug dealers. That's right. It doesn't pay. It don't pay. It don't. Not only do it not pay in, 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 in just living, but you corrupt your soul. When you know something is right, the hardest thing in the world to do sometimes is to stand for it when you think that no one is going to accept what you're saying. Or when you think, I'm gonna get, I'm, I'm, they ain't going to like this. But that's, that's all right. That's how you know that God is working in you a lot of times because you're standing up for things that somebody else wouldn't stand up for. And a lot of these companies today, they, these, these CEOs and all these people, I mean, I watch these folks here at, at where I work at, and they, they're cutting people's jobs and salaries and not giving nobody promotions and, 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 and increases. But these top bosses making millions. I mean, when I say millions, I ain't talking about like five, six, seven millions. I'm talking about 70, 80, 200 million. I mean, come on. I mean, get, get, you know, you read it and, and, and you, because, you, you know, they have to post their finance. That stuff is public. So you can go in Yahoo and see what they, and you go in there and you say, you know what, let me go see what this so-and-so, man. You look at it, you, you, you almost, you almost lose a lung. <laughs> I can't, I can't believe it. But that's the way it is. And what can you do about it? But that's how this world is. And so it's going to continue to get worse. It's going to continue to get worse. All right. So this is what's going on while they're in Thessalonica. They, they, they got this issue going on, this problem. They got these, these lewd men coming in there, and they ripping up town, so, so to speak, and they're causing stuff. And they said that, that, that uh, these are the men that have... Uh, turned the whole world upside down, and now they're in our town. And in verse seven it says, "Whom Jason has received." Now it says, "And Jason is the one that got he got th those guys hidden somewhere." And and, and these uh, all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. So now what they're trying to do? They're trying to find a political statement. Mm -hmm. They have they're doing contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, one Jesus. You see how they're trying to twist things? Mm -hmm. They're trying to make it so, well, they're saying that Jesus is the king to replace Caesar. So it's a play on words. They're twisting things around. In reality, what, what Paul is saying, that Jesus is the king of the world. He's the king of the universe. He's the king of all things. He's the king of everything. Now, he, that thing got nothing to do with Caesar. Jesus don't want Caesar's job. But they twisted it. They make it sound the way they want it to sound. People manipulate words just like that all the time. So bottom line is, uh, Paul, they had to leave uh, out of there. They had to get out of Thessalonica. Um, uh, verse 8, it says, And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city uh, when they heard these things and when they had taken security of Jason. In other words, they, they, they took Jason in captivity and, and the others... Uh, they let go. So we'll see now Jason, he's in trouble. Now, did Jason do the right thing? Yeah. Yes, he did. Is Jason in trouble? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But is Jason blessed? Yeah. Jason is blessed. But is he in trouble in his town? He's in trouble. See? So that's why we cannot let the, this modern day preaching tell us how we know we're blessed. You know you're blessed because you've been born again. You've been born a son of God and no longer are just a son of Adam. All right, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea. All right, now they're in another town. Who coming hither 
uh, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, you think they, a lot of times you would <laughs> they say, well, you know, we went into, you know, Thessalonica and, you know, we started talking about Jesus to all these, these folks in the synagogues. Maybe when we go to Berea, we just handle it a little different. Does it, do they handle it different? No. Not at all. You see, because they recognize my blessing has nothing to do but how I'm treated, how people like me, how people accept me. My blessing is, has to do with how I am doing and obeying the word of God. So verse 11, uh, these were more noble than the Thessalonians. Oh, they were more noble. Why? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Wow, they're listening to Paul. And search the scriptures daily. Not only are they listening to Paul, but they're doing what? They're studying. They said, well, give me a copy of that, that, of that, of that scriptures you got so I can read it for my what? No. Myself. And they did it They did it three, four, five times a year? Daily. Oh. What does daily mean? Often. Exactly. Every day, Every day. they're going into it. They're checking it out. All right? They, they treat scripture like we treat food. Hmm. So people that got one is like written down all of them is so. Mm -hmm. They see it as, as food. They, they, they can't go a day without it. Mm -hmm. All right? you, you, you ever try to go a day? I mean, when you're feeling healthy. I'm not talking about when you're sick. You know, when you're sick, you can, sometimes you have the flu or you, you, you don't want no food. But when you're normal, healthy, you try to go a day without eating? Mm -hmm. How old is your son? I go with Brother Matthew. He's 17. He's 17. Mm -hmm. 17 year old boy. Mm -hmm. You ever see him go a day without eating? <laughs> Not a minute. Not a minute. <laughs> you see this little fellow over here? Twelve years old. If I tried to make him go a day without eating, it'd be on the news. Because it'd be some uproar. But boys have big appetites. They, they do. Yeah, they do. You're right. Still but the point. He throw it down, That's boy. Right. And they don't want no one egg and a half a piece of toast or nothing. No, I, got a, no, I got a brother that eat a whole loaf of eggs and the whole dozen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like nine of us. I got seven brothers. Yeah, they, they can eat. But I have a brother that can't, don't eat for like, oh, here you go. Mm -hmm. When he eats, he just. Mm -hmm. But now, but now, Muslim, now transform that to, to the spiritual appetite. See, if our spiritual appetite works with the desire that our fleshly appetite has, we would be hungry for the word. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that, see, there's no one sitting in here, that you come here on your own accord, that you don't have a spiritual appetite. You, that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. That's why you, you drive and get dressed up and do all what you got to do so you can get, so you can get some understanding about the word because you have a spiritual appetite. And that's a healthy thing to have as a person that's born again. A newborn baby that's not hungry, that doesn't want to eat, is in trouble. Same thing with a, with a person. When we're born again, we got to want not just natural food, but we should have an inner appetite. I, I need that spiritual food. And that means you're healthy. That means that you, 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 you're... you're um, your, your, your birth into the spiritual realm is normal and you're growing because you, you have the appetite. Bereans were like that. All right? They wanted to know. Verse 12, Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were uh, Greeks, and not of men, uh, not a few. Now that's a funny way of saying there were a lot of men too. Not of men, not a few. In our world, we, we say that's you know, uh, double negatives or whatever they call it, but they always say they're here before us. I'm like, whatever. Just remember, you need all these out your back. Well, we can't do it. Who's that? Who's that? Was that James Brown? They said, it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing okay. without a woman or a girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember James Brown. Yeah. All right, 13. It says, and when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge of the word of God was preached of Paul and Berea, they came thither also to do what? To stir up the people. Now, the folks in Berea were doing fine with this, right? 
they were like, wow, this is great teaching, man. And they were all accepting. Now, the folks, the, the Jews that were in Thessalonica that, that ran Paul and Silas out of town, mm -hmm. they heard what was going on in Berea. Yeah. What did they do? They ran over to Berea. We got to go. We got to go get those. Let's get those thugs. Let's go get those lewd fellas that we had to help stir up stuff here and send them over to Berea. And let's do the same thing. You see how the devil works? You always keep in mind. See, there, there are types not only of, uh, uh, of Christ, but there are types. The Bible says that the spirit of Antichrist is already here. And so this is the spirit of Antichrist. It will not allow, it will always try to corrupt, to misuse anything. And then when the Lord is really working well, you are a target. Whatever you do it becomes now a target. And so they thought, oh, we're going to go, we're going to go mess this up. And so they send folks over there um, to stir up the people. Verse 14. And then immediately the brethren uh, sent away Paul out. Uh, sent away Paul, uh, uh, says, but Silas and Timothy abode uh, there still. So they sent Paul away once they realized, because these men were. These men, first of all, keep in mind, they were not playing. This was for real. See, they, they, they meant real damage to Paul. So, and, and the thing that we, keep, we can also keep in mind, uh, until Paul was finished with what he had to do, nothing was going to happen to Paul. But once he finished his work, because Paul tells you in his writings, he goes, he says, I finished my course. I'm done. And so I now, I now know that laid up for me is a crown of righteousness. That's Paul's way of saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to be put to death. I know I am. But he said, that's okay, because I've done everything God wanted me to do. But they, at this point here, Paul is, you know, nothing's really going to happen to him at this point, because he's not done. But at the same time, they're still saying, well, you know what, Paul? We still, because <laughs> they're trying to figure out, should we leave you here? You notice that you didn't hear, or you don't see in the commentary, that God spoke to Paul or that Paul got a sign. No one got a sign as to whether he should stay or go. So they're still trying to use just what? Wisdom. Should you stay? Should you leave? Should we should we stand with us with our own swords? Should we fight? And they said, look, you know, it's almost like water. We learn a lot from water. As much as you can, we we we'll be like water. Take the path of what? Least resistance. Water is not gonna try to go up a hill. Water, if, it, if the, the road is slanted that way, we're going to go that way. You know, I'll be fine. But there are other times when you're going to have to be uh, empowered to go places that normally you won't go. When you woke up this morning, you turn your faucet on, the water came through your shower. You know? Water don't usually come through a shower but on its own, unless it has what? Some kind of something that's going to give it some water pressure. So if the Spirit speaks to us and it moves us and pushes us, in places that we normally wouldn't wouldn't go, then we need to go. But if we don't see, then then just flow. Just allow God to use use your wisdom, use your knowledge, use your skill, use your ability. Do what you got to do, and keep on going. Pray. The Bible says, uh, "In all thy ways, acknowledge Him, and He will what direct. direct your path." So even when you're just trying to just do what you got to do every day, just Everything that you do, ask the Lord, you know, continue to direct my path, help me to go. And you say, well, I ask God, I don't hear nothing. Then just keep on going. Just keep doing. God said, because when you need to make a course correction and it's going against the grain, you will be empowered. You will get some water pressure to go in a direction that normally you would not be able to go in. But other than that, just, just go on the flow. Be a river. Just move. It's like the God lets these... Like let the Mississippi go and the Nile flow, you flow. All right. And so Paul is like, you know, they're like, right, we're gonna get Paul out of here. And that seemed like a wisdom, a wise thing to do. Now, see, some people will say, no, I ain't. I'm, I'm gonna stand in the power and the might of God. Come and hit me, shoot me, shoot me. I got the spirit of God. Pow, pow. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you know. So we, <laughs> you, you need wisdom. All right, there's no need to put on no cape or nothing because guess what? We are not God. We are born again, children of the Lord, and we need God's direction. 
and we're living in a corrupt world. Always remember that. All right, and so, yeah, use wisdom. And, you know, so um, they got Paul. Uh, verse 14 says that they, uh, the brethren sent away Paul. And they, he got him out of there, but, but Silas and Timothy abode still. Verse 15. And says, uh, and they that uh, conducted Paul brought him unto where? Athens. And received a, the commandment of, unto Paul, unto Silas and Timothy, for to come to him with all speed. Uh, they departed. All right, so now Paul is in Athens, and he's asking for who to come and meet him there. Silas and who? Timotheus. All right, so now we're going from Berea now to where? To Athens. All right, we started at Thessalonica. Then we went to Berea. Now we're in Athens. Now we're going to just uh, get into this a little bit, and then we're going we're gonna to stop. But I wanted to point this out. I uh, just want to get a little bit going here. All right, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to what? Idolatry. Right? Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons uh, and in the markets daily with, uh, with them that met with him. All right. Now, we're going to we're going to really stop here because what we're going to do when we start next week is we're going to get into this aspect of what is talked about in verse 18. I'm going to read it and then we're going to really discuss it again on next week cuz uh, I'm going to need some time to do this. It says and and when certain philosophers What is a philosopher? He's a person that does what? Tries to figure out how things work that we can't really figure out. Exactly. So he tries to tell you, a philosopher tries to, well, what actually is self-awareness? What is consciousness? How come we're concerned about whether our shoes uh, uh, have holes in them but a dog will walk through with briar patches stuck and stuff stuck to his, his fur coat, and re, as long as he don't have no pain, he could care less. Yeah. Why does a Why do we look in the mirror and wonder how we're looking, whereas a dog will look in the mirror and be like, he he don't even know it's a dog. He don't even like his shadow. <laughs> he don't even like his shadow. Why does a Why does a dog chase his tail when we know, when you know, we, we don't chase our feet, or, you know, we don't run around. We humans, so we gotta look perfect in the world, in right. the animal. So why, why, what's the difference between our thinking and the thinking of an animal? What is the, um, if, if there is, if, if there is a noise made, but no one actually hears it, does the noise actually happen? You know, if a tree falls well, in the forest? Well, yeah. So philosophers do all that kind of discussion and talk getting in. And, and and some of it is, is interesting stuff. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying this to make make light of, of, but some of it is, you know, a little bit. You know, how do you, how do you know you really exist? Are you real? Are how do you know that uh, you are who you say you are? And so they go into all these so-called deep questions. And so we want to spend some time and talk about verse 18. It says, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics account, uh, encountered him. All right, and so we want to get into what these philosophers, especially these Epicureans and Stoics, what are they, who are they, and what is this thing that's going on, and why was Paul so moved by their idolatry that he saw, and what did he see when he went into Athens that made him go, that made him so stirred up about uh, all these things. So we'll stop there and we'll pick all that up again on uh, next week. All right? Any comments or questions?